Good evening, everyone. My name is Mahesh Narayanan. I'm a product manager in Google Cloud. I'm joined by two other product managers, Olivier Vautron, Vautrin, Vautrin, OK. Uh, Vautrin, uh, who is also a product manager in Google Cloud, and uh, Aleem Karim, who is a product manager in NetApp. And they're also going to make sure that nobody's sleeping, so please keep your eyes open. Uh, they can, I can't. All right, hopefully that got some laugh. Uh, all right, so just some housekeeping. We have uh, the Dory Q&A. So if you have any questions, please, about the session, please uh, submit them through the Dory tool. It's an internal tool in Google that we use quite a lot. It gives an opportunity for everybody to ask questions. Uh, the catch is, if you like a question, please upvote them so that uh, there's a higher probability of those questions to be asked. Okay. So um, a very simple and easy way to connect to any Google service is through internet. So if you are on-prem, you can get a dedicated internet access and connect to Google service. If you are consuming these services from uh, VPC or from GCP, whether it be a GCE instance or a GKE cluster, we have by default public IPs, and you can connect to them easily. But there is a, a lot of companies have security and compliance requirement which mandates that you do not use public IPs, right? So to meet that mandate, you have a cloud VPN or you buy an interconnect service from Google, such as a dedicated interconnect or partner interconnect. On the GCP side, you deploy VMs without a private IP or you create private GKE clusters. So the problem statement now becomes, how do you connect to Google services privately from on-prem as well as from GCP? So the agenda of this session is to talk about what are, different types, what are the different types of managed services on Google, and then provide you the solutions that are available to connect privately to these services. And to round it out, we'll have Aleem talk about how they're using one of these solutions to offer cloud volume product from NetApp on GCP. So there are primarily two types of Google services. The first service is, is hosted on Google infrastructure, and it is front-ended by an internal Google proxy from the compute resources, such as a GCE or a GKE cluster. Examples of search services are GCE, Google Cloud Storage, um, BigQuery, Cloud Spanner. And the solution that is available to connect to these services privately is called private Google Access. The second type of Google service is, is the one that is hosted on the Google Cloud infrastructure. And we use VPC peering as a primitive to connect to these services. So think of these services as another customer on Google Cloud, but this, this happens to be uh, a service that Google provides. It's hosted by Google. Example of serv service, such services are Cloud SQL, uh, if you're using GKE, then GKE private clusters. And the solution to connect to these services privately is called private service access. So these are the two services. So we looked at, just to recap, we have two different type of services. One hosted on Google infrastructure, the other hosted on Google cloud infrastructure. And the ones hosted on Google uh, cloud infrastructure is called private service access. The one that is hosted on Google infrastructure, the solution is called private Google access. I'll talk about private Google access. Olivier and Alim are going to talk about private service access. But before we go into the solutions, let's take a step back and get a good understanding of what a VPC is in GCP, because that forms the basic building block of all these services. Oops. So in, in a VPC is basically a customer's, uh, a, a customer's network in, in Google Cloud. It's a virtual network, and it is global in nature. What global means is, let's say you have a deployment in US West and another deployment in US East. We do not require you to create two different VPCs. If you have a deployment in East, US East and US West, you do not need two different VPCs if they want to talk to each other. With global VPCs, these two deployments can talk to each other automatically 
without any special provisioning on your side. We also offer VPC peering. So if you have a VPC in your project, in your org, you can connect to another VPC in the same project or a different project in your org, or you can connect to another VPC in a totally different org. So that's what VPC peering provides. Now let's talk about private Google Access. <clears throat> we saw how internet was not an option to connect to these services. So previously, it was a simpler task to figure out where the service, uh, where the request to these services is coming from, because each customer gets a unique uh, public IP. With private IP, we need to understand which customer is sending this, this request. This black box to the customer is, is a proxy, is an internal Google proxy, which we call Google Cloud Frontend. So it's called a Cloud Frontend proxy. What it does is, like a gateway, it connects the customer's network to the Google infrastructure the service is lying on Google infrastructure. It understands what IPs does a customer's VPC have and make sure that the traffic is routed back to it. Now that we understand the glue, let's look, let's see what are the the what is the workflow in setting up private Google Access. So the, the first step is to advertise a specific a, a new prefix and make DNS changes. And this is pretty much, these are the two steps, whether you are on on-prem or if you are on cloud, if you are using a, from a GC or a GKE cluster. Let's look at the setup for, for on-prem. So I talked about you know, announcing a special prefix, a new prefix. Why do we need that? Well, Google APIs, Google services already have a, have a public IP. You, know, you are routing to them publicly over internet. So we need a special or a new prefix that identifies, identifies the private path to these services. And this is called a restricted VIP. If you were to do an NS lookup on the restricted VIP, uh, you will get a slash 30 block, which is 199.36.153.4 slash 30. Even though it's a, although it's a public IP, it is not publicly routable, okay? So now that we have this restricted VIP, you can go on your cloud router, which is you know, something that you'll be using if you're doing cloud VPN or an interconnect partner or dedicated. Create a custom route with this slash 30 block and announce it over BGP to on-prem. Now, your on-prem resources have this route, but how does the application, how does the client libraries know that they need to send traffic to this slash 30? We obviously don't want you to change your applications. So the simplest way to achieve this is through DNS, right? And there are three popular ways of doing this. Uh, from on-prem, you can change the config map to resolve star.googleapis.com to restrictedgoogleapis.com. If you are on GCP, you can use the cloud DNS product and uh, specifically private, uh, uh, private zone feature within cloud DNS to uh, you know, resolve the star.google API to a C name to uh, restrictedgoogleapis.com. And also you can use you know, on GCP, bind, or any other DNS of your choice. Now, if you're setting up connectivity, private connectivity from uh, VPC resources, uh, compute resources on VPC, such as a GC or a GKE cluster, uh, you need to select the, a subnet there is a flag called private Google access. So you need to select that. And then once you create the VM, you uh, ensure that the VM is created on this particular subnet. Please keep in mind that the VPC has a, has a routing table, and the default route of that routing table still says internet gateway. So when you send out, with this setup, when you send out a request to a googleapi.com and star.googleapi.com, it, it uses the default route, but even though it says the internet gateway, it's not actually, it's, it's, the traffic still stays on Google backbone. The, the other uh, step is the, so there is also like I just talked about how there is a routing table and the default route points to internet gateway. To, from a security perspective, if you want to lock down your network, and if you want to remove this default route, you can go ahead and do that. And you can have the same 199.36.153.4 slash 30 restricted VIP 
Uh, you can create a static route with that, pointing to the default internet gateway. I'll reiterate, even though it says default internet gateway, the traffic is not going out to internet. It stays within Google backbone. And any traffic in Google that is destined towards this slash 30 restricted VIP, our SDN layer is smart enough to realize that this traffic is destined to a service behind the Google proxy. Right? So these are some of the steps that you can take to, to connect uh, to services privately using private Google Access. With that, I'll hand, hand it over to Olivier. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes? Perfect. So thanks, Mahesh. Um, so we just looked at uh, how do we connect uh, services that are on the Google infrastructure, so services such as uh, JCS, Spanner, and so on. So we are now, looking, uh, now going to look at uh, the services that are hosted inside the Google Cloud infrastructure, inside GCP. And uh, same problematic. So we are going to, um, the problem statement is, how can I access from my VPC, from a service in a VPC, to this managed service privately with a, via a private IP? And also, how can I do that from on-prem? So from on-prem to my managed service without going through internet. So services uh, on the GCP infra infrastructure are services like Cloud SQL, Cloud Filer, GK Private Master, and so on. So who is um, using uh, Cloud SQL here? Who has already used Cloud SQL here? OK. Who has used uh, Cloud SQL with a private IP already? OK. So I see a lot of hands for Cloud SQL, but not Cloud SQL with a private IP. So Cloud SQL with private IP is a service that has been launched, uh, I think it was back in September. Uh, and uh, it's using um, the functionality that I'm, that I'm going to describe uh, right now. <coughs> OK. So services in top of GCP are using the same building block that any other uh, um, uh, service on GCP. That means that we are using VPC, VM, and so on. So you have, on the left side, you have a consumer VPC, so uh, a consumer that would like to use the service. And on the right side, we have the producer VPC, so the producer that uh, has developed the service, that is managing the service. How do we connect two VPC together on GCP? We are using VPC peering. And that's a way we connect privately from a consumer to a private to a, a producer. The advantage of VPC peering is because there's no uh, proxy and no device between the two VPC, it's direct connection between the two VPC. Uh, it's high throughput and very low delay, which is very important for database uh, type of services. Uh, at the same time, uh, the producer VPC is going to be unique for each consumer VPC. So every time a consumer would like to create a new service, we are going to have a specific producer VPC for this service uh, to, to have a security between all those instances. So before explaining how to use VPC peering for the on-prem connectivity and so on, I need to take a quick segue and explain a new feature that we launch for Next. And this feature is the capacity to exchange uh, custom routes with VPC peering. And you're going to see later how we are using this feature for on-prem connectivity. In a VPC, we have three types of routes. We have subnet routes, we have static routes, and we have dynamic or BGP routes. Stat subnet routes are the routes that are already uh, automatically created by the system. Static and BGP routes are routes that are created by the user of the VPC. Right? And that's why we call static and dynamic routes uh, custom routes, because you can customize them. By default, with VPC peering, only subnet routes are exchanged. So by default, when you do VPC peering, all the subnets are exchanged, but the static and BGP routes are not exchanged. So to allow the exchange of static and dynamic routes, we have uh, flags that you can update on the VPC peering. So we have import and export flag on each side of the VPC peering connection. 
So that, by, that means four flags, right? Two on the v two on the first VPC and two on the on the second VPC. An import and export flag on each side. If you have an export flag for custom route as true, that means that you are okay to send those routes to your next VPC. If you set the flag as import as true, that means that you are okay to learn the routes from the other VPC. For those of you that are familiar with BGP, that seems that should be very familiar to you. It's very similar to policy-based routing on uh, uh, typical routers. Uh, let's take an example. So in this example, I have two VPC, and my goal here, uh, let's assume that my goal is uh, to create a, a route uh, for a specific subnet. I would like to send traffic to the VM B that is on the right side. Right? So I have my VM A for a specific destination. I would like to have as a next stop a VM B on the right side. On GCP today, it is not possible to create a static route with a next stop on another VPC. So how do we do that without cre creating a static route with an export with a next stop in another VPC? So the first way, the first thing is we need to create a static route on the second VPC. Okay? So let's look at the routing table for uh, one minute. So on each VPC here, we have a subnet. So that's why we have a local route, that's a subnet route. And we have um, the route to the subnet on the other VPC, right, with next stop peer. So 10.30 is my local subnet. 10.40 is my subnet on VPC B. Now that I configured a static route on the VPC B, I see a third route on the right side. I see a third route, which is my static route uh, with 10.100 sending traffic as a next stop BMB. But still, it's not enough because on VPC A, I can still not see the routes. So the, the next step is to configure an export policy on VPC B so that I can say, please export that route to VPC A. But you can see that it's not enough because even with uh, the export, I don't see the routes on the routing table of VPC A. So what is missing is an import statement, so an import flag as true. If I put the import flag as true, then suddenly I see the static routes uh, on my routing table. Okay? So um, you can see that uh, I need to configure both flag for security reason. So both VPC need to agree on what to exchange. And what's that done? Uh, I'm exchanging uh, my static routes or my BGP route between my VPC. Another, another use case for um, the exchange of static and dynamic routes is what we call uh, transit VPC. So with transit VPC, let's say that I would like to share a VPN or an interconnect across multiple VPC. I mean, obviously, a simple way to do that would be to have multiple VPN. Um, but that would be very complex or expensive. So let's say that I would like to share a VPN or interconnect across multiple VPC. So a way to do that is to have to create a, to create a VPC that we will call a transit VPC. This VPC can be empty or with resources in it. And in this VPC, I'm going to um, have export flag on all the other VPC. And automatic, automatically, all my routes are going to be exchanged between on-prem to all the VPC here. So it's dynamic. So even if you change routes on uh, on-prem, automatically with BGP and with my export policy, all the VPC will be updated with the new routes. Uh, some advantage of this solution. So uh, there's no bandwidth limit. It's VPC peering. So with VPC peering, there's no uh, bandwidth uh, limit. It's direct connection. Um, VPC peering is free, beside the price of uh, egress um, of normal uh, uh, traffic usage. So VPC peering is free. And every, time every type of connectivity is supported. So it's VPN, but it's also interconnects. OK. Now that we looked at um, this new feature, how to exchange route between uh, all the type of route between my VPC, 
how can I use that for my problem statements? And my problem statements is, again, how can I connect from my on-prem to my managed services? And for to, to connect from on-prem to my managed service privately, I need, to, I need two things. I need to exchange routes between on-prem and the VPC, and my, and my VPC, and the consumer VPC. And I need to exchange all those routes between the consumer VPC and the managed service. OK, so let's do that one by one. First, I have a VPC peering between the managed service and the consumer of this service. I'm exporting all the routes to the managed service VPC. And then I need to configure a custom advertisement on the cloud router of the consumer VPC to send those routes to on-prem. So with those two steps, export of routes to the managed service VPC and the BGP advertisements to on-prem. I have full connectivity end-to-end -end between um, the on-prem and uh, my managed service. OK. <coughs> but that could be a bit complex, right? I mean, so le let's, say, let's assume that I just want to, uh, to have a Cloud SQL instance, or let's say I want to have a simple MySQL database. Now, suddenly, I need to understand VPC peering. I need to understand export import might be a bit complex. So how can we simplify all this? And the way we simplify all this is uh, by creating a new, s a new scheme called uh, private service access, now in GA. And the way to think about private service access is it's a, it's a managed VPC peering connection. So when I want to create a simple service, like a MySQL instance, the VPC peering connection will be automatically created for me. Right? All the steps will be done for me. So I don't need to understand VPC peering for a simple service, for a simple service creation. So how does that work in details? Let's assume that I am the owner of a VPC. So here it's a VPC green. So let's assume that I'm the owner of the VPC green, and I would like to create a MySQL instance. My first step is to decide which IP range my service should use. So it's to allocate a range for all my managed services. Uh, this range can be a slash 24, can be as small as a slash 24, or can be larger, because it can be larger because it, it will be shared across all my services. So let's say I, ha I would like to have 50, 100 services. Uh, I can have a large range, and each one of them can pick a different IP in this range. So we do advise uh, to use a large range if possible. The many customers cannot have large range because they don't have um, a lot of private IP available. But if you can, it's better to have a large range, like a slash 16. And then every time you create a new service, they can pick addresses from, from this range. So in this example, uh, I'm the owner of VPC Green. I located a slash 24. On the right side, you can see the uh, UI of um, the Cloud SQL creation. And it's as simple as clicking on private IP instead of public IP. So if you go to advanced option on MySQL, on Cloud SQL, MySQL. There's an option on advanced networking to select private IP. So when you select private IP, connect, automatically the system is going to pick to create a MySQL instance in a VPC using the right IP range, using a, a private IP in the range as you selected. And we automatically create the VPC peering for you. Now that we, I gave an example for one service, let's take an example with two services, or multiple services. <coughs> In this example, again, I'm the, the uh, owner of um, the green VPC, 
and I would like two services instead of one. Same way, I can go on the UI and say I would like to have um, a service from uh, NetApp or from uh, Google. And the system is going to create automatically one VPC peering per producer of those services. So in this case, if let's say there's two producers, Google and NetApp, I'm going to have a VPC peering for each one of them. <coughs> shared VPC support. So the issue with shared VPC is, um, in this case, um, there's two service projects in, in, my VP, in my shared VPC. So with shared VPC, I can divide my VPC in multiple service projects so that each team can have different billing and different IAM rights for the resources in my VPC. Uh, <coughs> the issue with shared VPC in this case is typically the owner of a service project do not have permission to create the VPC peering. And so, in theory, uh, they cannot, uh, the owner of a service project cannot create connection to a service because they don't have this permission and they need to ask for every creation of service, they need to ask the permission from the network admin, from the network admin owner of the shared VPC. So the way we solve that is, yes, for the first connection to a, sh to a service provider, you do need to ask for permission. But for, for every other connection, the VPC peering is already there, and so you don't need to ask for permission. So the permission is asked once, once for every service provider, and when the service provider, uh, when the connection has been created to the service provider, each owner of those services, of, this, of those service projects, can create their instances without asking for permission. To summarize, to summarize, Mahesh discussed about uh, all the services running on the Google infrastructure. I discussed about the services running on the Google infrastructure, on the GCP, on the Google Cloud infrastructure. And there's two solutions, one for each. So the uh, services on the Google infrastructure, like JCS, like Spanner, uh, use something called private Google Access. The services built on GCP, like Cloud SQL, Redis, uh, Memcached or uh, TPU or um, GKE Private Master are using uh, private service access. And private service access is using VPC peering. Private Google access is using a proxy to separate the G GCP infrastructure and the Google infrastructure. So we are now going to, um, to see how NetApp has built their services using uh, private service access and how they use VPC peering to give a very uh, low latency um, uh, filer application. Can you guys hear me okay? Thanks. Thanks, Olivia. So just a quick show of hands, uh, who has heard of Cloud Volumes and the solution that NetApp and Google are building together? Well, our marketing department's doing something, so that's good. So just for a recap, uh, what is Cloud Volumes? Uh, what does it do? Who's interested in it? I'll, I'll just spend one slide uh, covering that. Um, essentially, Cloud Volumes is a fully managed cloud native file services offering. Uh, it's really meant to provide high throughput, low latency NFS and SMB storage. Uh, and it's really targeted at moving enterprise applications that customers use to run on premise uh, into GCP. So really used for things like SAP uh, or running other uh, enterprise applications like uh, content management systems, B2B e-commerce systems and such. Typically what you'll find is, you know, there's also a set of industries like media and entertainment, uh, like life sciences, um, as well as genomic sequencing that are interested in running NAS specific applications in GCP. And these are basically industries that have been using NAS on premise for a very, very long time and therefore have tools, processes and skill sets built around NAS and they want to extend these into public cloud GCP more specifically uh, and therefore they need managed NAS solutions in GCP to move 
move these business processes or applications over. Uh, in terms of who's interested in a solution like Cloud Volumes, typically it is cloud architects or application owners who have been tasked with essentially either moving a business process or an application into GCP. Uh, and ultimately, it's application teams being able to then provision uh, and, and manage these NFS or SMB endpoints themselves uh, once they're in GCP. So on the right-hand side is a quick screenshot of what this looks like. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a native interface into GCP through the cloud console. Uh, customers can go in, create a volume, and essentially consume it for e from either GCE or GKE instances. So one quick slide here to show what the architecture of cloud volumes looks like. Uh, there's a dotted line in, the, in sort of the middle of the picture that sort of separates the control plane from the data plane. Uh, I'll talk about the control plane quickly. As I said, the users enter into cloud volume service through their normal pathways, either through the cloud console or using the API and soon coming the CLI. Uh, th that then hits our control plane, which is running natively in GKE. Uh, and that talks to other parts of the GCP ecosystem uh, around authentication for IAM for the, for the users that are logging in, uh, pushing metrics into Stack Driver, logging metrics for auditing, uh, as well as you know, integration into the billing APIs. And essentially, from this perspective, the customer sees a native volume in their GCP project. Volumes are isolated by project. Uh, and then these resources are billed directly into, into the customer's billing account without having any interaction with NetApp. The interesting part that is per that pertains to VPC peering and such is the data path setup at the bottom. So for every customer that comes in and every customer that has a host project, uh, basically we set up a VPC peer connection between their, their VPC and ours where we provision all of the resources that are needed to supply all of the NFS endpoints that they need. So at the bottom of the diagram you see uh, there's a set of cloud volumes that this customer has gone ahead and created. These volumes exist on the producer side, so on our side, uh, and then we expose mount points, which are RFC 1918 addresses that they give us uh, back into their infrastructure so that they can mount these NFS volumes uh, and essentially access them from either GCE or GKE. So what does private services connectivity do for us? Really, it's three key things. Number one is we really want to simplify the end user experience around that data path setup. Right, so we just want we just want customers to come in and simply peer with us and our producer services to be able to get access. We want to really abstract away all of the networking complexities that take that it takes to deliver a service from an NFS perspective and keep that on our side and simply expose the, the other end of a VPC peer to the customer. Uh, with NFS applications that I mentioned, like SAP and some of these other industry specific applications, performance is a very very cre key criteria. Most applications need a lot of throughput and very, very low latency, and VPC peering allows us to achieve that. Uh, and then finally, it gives our customers a uniform way of accessing these services, just like other services like Cloud SQL that Olivia talked about. The second big benefit is private IP. It's a private IP-based service. For any of you that are familiar with NFS, you'll realize that the data that is stored on NFS and the applications that use NFS typically contain sensitive, secure um, data, which means that you can't really have public endpoints on, uh, on an NFS share. So this you know, essentially allows customers to give us their RFC 1918 uh, addresses that they want to see on these endpoints. And then finally, uh, dealing with large enterprise customers, over 90% of them have a shared VPC topology. So being able to support that is a key requirement for us. And again, private services connectivity gives us that as well. So, and, and as Olivia mentioned, so this allows us to sort of have a one-time setup from a host project perspective into our service, and then all of the service projects that follow uh, can then just consume these services without re requiring any additional setup. 